Okay, so remember, where fertilization, fertilization occurs usually somewhere in the arm of the fallopian tube, oviduct, ovarian tube. So you can see here again with the ovary that it's close to the fallopian tube and these fimbrae. The oocyte or fertilized egg burst through the wall of the ovary during ovulation. If the oocyte is fertilized, it goes from the primary oocyte and then quickly does second stage of meiosis to the secondary oocyte with fertilization. Again, remember, fertilization occurs in the oviduct, lopin tube, ovarian tube. Remember, remember, remember that. Does not happen in the uterus. It's already, if it's fertilized, it's already pretty well developed by the time it gets into the uterus. So you see what's called cleavage begins to occur. Cleavage means cleaving, cut in two, right? So with cleavage, you go from one cell to two cells, or sorry, one cell to two cells to four cells eight cells to 16 cells, eventually to the solid ball of cells that's pretty dense with cells, the morula. Beginning of, I should say the end of the first week, beginning of the second week, you have the blastula. This term blastocyst or blastula, interchangeable. With the blastula, you begin to start to get a separation of cells, you get two cell masses within this ball of cells. You get the cells that are going to become the embryo itself, and then you get all of the other, what we would call accessory cells to development. So when you're looking at like the embryo, if I'm the little embryo, all the other cells are going to help me to survive pregnancy. So I'm gonna to start to make things like amniotic fluid, or those cells are gonna make amniotic, amniotic fluid and amniotic sac around me, umbilical cord, chorionic villi, to villi to reach into the placenta. So all of those things are going to be like a separation beginning, and you can see that you're starting to get, you can see the umbilical cord and then eventually the chorionic villi that are going to reach into and the placenta will begin to form here where the embryo develops. The other thing that I want you to recognize is the mass, the original size of the oocyte due to those specializations that happen during meiosis of the oocyte that you have upon meiosis one separation into two daughter cells, one gets all of the um, cytoplasm, and the other one just gets a division of the chromosomes, you get chromosome division in each, and this one becomes a polar body and is absorbed by the body, and you get one big cell. Do you get division of those cells? Um, are you talking about that when they have the ovary or in the fallopian? So it begins, so in, it begins in the ovary, mm -hmm. 
the ovulation, it stimulates meiosis one to occur. So it's kind of like meiosis one is about somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. If fertilization occurs, meiosis two is stimulated. So there's gonna be a polar body. There'll be a polar body formed here. Okay. And if there's fertilization, another polar body. Okay. Yes. If there's no fertilization, you only get one polar body. Meiosis two only happens if fertilization occurs. So recognize here that by meiosis two, you get one big oocyte or egg, and you get two polar bodies on the two different parts of meiosis. But look at the mass, the size, or the mass of the secondary oocyte. It, the mass stays about the same all the way through or up to gastrulation. Okay, so size of the mass stays the same. Let's talk about number of cells. What about the number of cells? Do the number of cells through this process increase, decrease, or stay the same? Yeah, so you're going from one cell to two cells to four cells, right? The cells are increasing in size. Size of the cells. We have one cell to two cells to four cells. Do all, you know, maybe thousands of cells here. Do the size of the cells increase, decrease, or stay the same from here to here? So let's just look at here. You go from one big cell, they split in half. Those split in half. So do the cells increase, decrease, or stay the same? The size of the cells decrease. So we've got three things that are, I just want you to recognize during this process. The cell mass, the mass, it's staying the same, right? Just looking at up until the end of the blastula phase, look at the mass here and the mass of the secondary oocyte. They are approximately the same. Mass stays the same. The number of cells are increasing, right? One cell, two cell, four cells, and it increases, increases, and increases. You get thousands of cells by the time you get here. The size of the cells split, 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 split. The size of the cells get smaller. You can just see that from one cell to two cells, right? Gone in half. Each of those goes in half. Each of those goes in half, 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 half. Okay, so three things to recognize. Cell mass stays the same. The number of cells increases. The size of each cell gets smaller. Boy, I went over that a lot, didn't I? The clue, right? So here, when we're getting to the next phase, what we're seeing is that the endometrium, the job of the endometrium, every month, the female builds up this endometrium, the lining of the wall of the uterus with blood and nutrients and all kinds of good stuff in anticipation that there might be a fertilized egg. If there is a fertilized egg and you saw the process of going to implantation, wherever that implants, you see the beginning stages and eventually the advancement of a placenta. The uterus responds upon implantation to start to produce placenta. Placenta is produced by the biological mother. But all of these accessories through what these little finger-like things here look like, chorionic villi, which reach into the walls of the placenta, they're going to allow for a blood-to-blood -blood connection. And what happens here is that you can see from the umbilical cord, it starts splitting and branching, branching, branching to smaller blood vessels. So you get capillaries in here, 
into these little branches that are reaching into the placenta. And in this area of the placenta, there's blood. So these chorionic villi are bathing in pools of the mother's blood to allow for exchange of essential nutrients and other things between the developing embryo or fetus and think about this as the mother. So let's talk about the job of the placenta. So as I mentioned, the placenta, it's all this kind of interwoven tissue between the embryo and the endometrium, or think about endometrium. Remember that endometrium is produced by the mother, and then you have the developing embryo. So there you've got this interaction between them. And that interaction is that blood connection. The placenta develops more and more as the embryo develops. And you can see in this picture next here how big the placenta becomes. Oh, wow. Yeah. The placenta is very relative in size to the size of the baby. Look how long. Umbilical cord is. Did you have a picture of the Did I? I, I will. I will. Oh, it's So there's two major jobs of the placenta. One is one that we often don't think about, but let's go back, back, back to thinking about the ovarian and menstrual cycle and the controllers of the ovarian and the menstrual cycle are hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Those continue to develop. The placenta's job, secrete that. Remember, key-wise, progesterone levels high means that the uterus does not contract and does not push out what's inside. In the menstrual cycle, when progesterone levels fall because the outer layers, the corpus luteum, starts to disintegrate, and thus the oocyte starts to disintegrate, those progesterone levels within a few days after ovulation go down and triggers the menstrual cycle. But what we're seeing here is the placenta is going to keep these two high, and keeping this high says, do not contract uterus, because you don't want to push out the developing embryo or fetus. The other job is what we often think about, is the selective exchange of materials. So let's talk about each of these in a little more detail on what especially estrogen and progesterone do individually. So estrogen, it's going to do two main things. It's going to say, hey uterus, you gotta grow. So it's gonna stimulate cells of the uterus to continue to go on, get bigger. Also, getting prepared for it after the fetus is out so that the mother can, with her own body, feed the baby. So the mammary glands are going to start to begin to develop. That's usually, um, not usually, but sometimes, often, a woman will know that they're pregnant because all of a sudden their breasts are really sore because the mammary glands are starting to get bigger. And when that gets bigger inside of your skin, you're gonna be like, ooh, that's tender there. So sometimes women will be like, uh-oh, this is, this is unique feeling here. And then that might trigger them to take a pregnancy test. Progesterone, as I mentioned, inhibits contraction of the uterus. And also, now you've got a double thing on the breasts, is that you've got the mammary glands are being stimulated also by progesterone. So this is really important to remember that there's, you know, again, all hormones increasing during the process 
of the development of the embryonic fetus. So here, just to show you that in the beginning, human, chorionic, gonadotropin, HCG, often called, often, often called CG, these levels are gonna be high during develop, development of the embryo. They'll start to taper down, but they won't go to zero. They'll kind of always be there. But as long as the cells of the fetus embryo, all of the accessory structures, amniotic fluid, uh, the amniotic sac, chorionic villi, and those part, this will be present. So what's different between all the structures we're talking about and like some of the womb? Same. Like the womb is like everything. Womb people will call like the uterus with the developing everything inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good question. So remember, HCG is produced by the embryo and fetus. Call it embryo in the beginning, fetus later on. So just to differentiate. So that's still going to be present as long as growth continues. Estrogen and progesterone are produced in the beginning also by, remember that you have the developing oocyte every time it splits also can produce some of this. But this is gonna go up because not only in the beginning is this all, all three of these produced by the embryo, but we're going to have with the development of the placenta, these are going to increase because the placenta also is going to contribute to the increase of those two hormones. <coughs> oh, I went the wrong way. The exchange of essential nutrients. So nutrients, meaning like atoms, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, giving oxygen to the fetus, the embryo, taking carbon dioxide away just through the process of cellular respiration. Other nutrients are passed from the mother to the fetus. So energy, essential nutrients for building of cells. Also taking away waste products like urea, kind of like, you know, like the things that are in urine through the umbilical cord. It's not peeing through the umbilical cord, but things that will be present in the umbilical cord would be things that would be released in the urine, but since the embryo can't do that inside of its own little amniotic sac, it gets released through the placenta and through the blood. So this is a really nice picture because it gives you a, a bit of perspective in terms of Here's the umbilical cord, and then the umbilical cord begins to split. The blood vessels begin to get smaller and smaller branches, and then you get these branches, like kind of like, um, remember in the intestines, that you have the villi and microvilli, it just means like finger-like things. You have chorionic villi, there's that villi word again, so you get these finger-like appendages that reach toward the placenta, so this is like tissue of the placenta, and this you have like an in between the two, in between the chorionic villi and the placenta, you have pools of blood. So that makes it easy for exchange of all those essential nutrients, giving oxygen, picked up and brought to the embryo, giving nutrients, energy, taking away waste products, carbon dioxide, urea, anything else that's a waste product of breaking down energy and nutrients. But other things can also be picked up in that area, like medications have to be very carefully monitored. What are the effect on any medications that the mother is taking? The doctor will be very specific. Let's talk about what you're taking. If the mother gets sick, if the mother's taking drugs, drinking alcohol. So you have to be very careful. Do you ever see what um, the newborn baby's lungs would look like if the mother was a smoker? Like cigarettes? The, the toxins, not that it won't directly affect the lungs because that's like breathing 
in the toxins and the dropping of the little like um, particles from burning the cigarette. But the toxins in cigarette smoke that are absorbed into the mother's body and into her blood will diffuse into the fetus. So not directly into the lungs, but the whole body. So the lungs are the um, carcinogens in the fetus. There's 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 at least twelve carcinogens that are known, um, and there's over two hundred toxic substances. Those all could go into the fetus. Yeah. Right. So then how does like fetal alcohol syndrome work? We're gonna get to that. Um, alcohol is very dangerous because it is water soluble, which means that it can easily diffuse in the blood, from blood to blood. We'll get to that in a second. We've got data on that. So all of these things, if you're sick, you gotta be really careful. So for example, when I was pregnant, my husband was going to Burundi which is a country in Africa, and he had to get the yellow fever vaccine. The yellow fever vaccine has a little tiny bit of active virus in it. It is, yellow fever is very dangerous. My husband, for uh, after he got the vaccine and up to six to eight weeks, he could not kiss me. We could not have intercourse. He had to be very careful, wash his hands. He prepared food, he had to majorly like scrub down like a surgeon before he prepared any food for me. In case the virus was to Because mm -hmm. it would likely kill the fetus. Yeah. So you have to be very careful about diseases. Alcohol, we'll get to more on. Nicotine, smoking, any other drugs, any other drugs including prescription and over-the-counter drugs. You have to be very careful, gotta read all the directions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, first about microbes. <sighs> Syphilis can be passed from mother to fetus. If someone, if a mother has syphilis, there's a 30 to 40% chance that the fetus will be born dead. That's called stillborn. That's pretty, that's high enough, right? So is the baby still alive to term and then just during labor it will die? Yeah, but usually before, like somewhere in the window of like the last trimester, so it's really well developed. And then it- Almost to term and then- Yeah, and then dies. And so th this is really tough because, um, and it can happen for a variety of reasons why people have sober um, children. Uh, when a child is, develop to the third, in late second, third trimester, you have to give birth to the dead yeah. fetus. That's really tough on the, the biological mother. Strep infections. So you gotta be very careful about strep, any kind of streptococcus infections. Like, for example, like necrotizing fasciitis, the skin-eating disease. That's a strep, strep throat. There's a lot of strep diseases. Listeria. Pregnant women cannot eat sushi, cold cuts, like any kind of meat that's in a, you know, like if you go to the deli, a lot of times you buy them, you'll buy them in the outside part of the grocery store, but like lunch meat, for example, or sliced meat, can't eat that. Especially from the deli counter. Anything in that deli counter, the open air, this could be present. So uh, any of the cheeses that are not pasteurized as well. So like brie, brie cheese, for example, goat cheese, you have to look and see, is it pasteurized or not? Viruses, so you get sick. Viruses, depending on what they are, so if you heard about, like, for example, the Zika virus has uh, been talked about a lot in South and Central America for probably about 10 years now. We don't hear about it as much, but it's still spreading there. Zika virus causes uh, encephalitis, which causes the brain to be smaller, the heads are smaller. 
So it can cause a lot of different like birth defects in terms of the brain. Premature birth, some viruses can cause. Eye defects, so anything, I mean, the brain, the brain controls everything, right? So if you have a virus that is going to do damage to the brain, it can have holistic effects on the body of the fetus. Genital herpes can be passed to the, the fetus, German measles. I just heard a story that because of COVID, because people are being more isolated now and not going to the doctor as much, that a lot of diseases like measles are starting to go up in number, polio, starting to go up again. So the, you know, like anti-vax and then the whole anti-vax thing and your choice and your freedoms and stuff like that, dangerous diseases are on the rise again. HIV can be passed. HIV, though, if a mother knows that she is HIV positive, they can give a medication so that there's a 95% chance that the fetus will not contract HIV. So there's a lot of good things. And I think that number is actually getting higher. Yeah. So yeah. I've heard that like HIV, they can't, I, I don't know if they, they can't deliver like bad news, right? They have to have this infection. Oh, potentially that like, yeah. So that's what you've read? Yeah. Okay. Well, that would make sense because then there's less um, cell connection. The tearing, if there's blood, yeah. I mean, often there's bleeding in the vagina as they're born. You don't want as much blood to blood connection. That's great. Thank you. But if they did that, can you still like swab the mom's birth canal for the other provider to pay the baby? As long as there's no blood. So that might be a weight kind of thing until after the mom is healed because you don't want to you know, have any blood. That's just another downside to it. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of it can be controlled with medication, which is a, a great advancement. However, as long as you're in a country that has access to those medications too, right? So, um, syphilis has so many issues. So usually if, when someone's pregnant, they will do blood tests and tests for, there's all kinds of tests happening. Syphilis will be one of them. Um, kids who are born to, parent, to a mother who has syphilis, eyes and ears, there may, may be defects, could be just like tube issues or they end up getting a lot of like infections or it could be blind or deaf. Teeth bones and joints don't often develop appropriately. So what, so can you like, like sometimes it's, it's not that the person maybe wasn't practicing safe sex or anything that they would be born with that STD? Yes. Okay. But usually th this can be knocked out with an antibiotic too. Oh, okay. So that's the thing. It's like if, if someone's having sex during pregnancy or, and it's usually like during pregnancy, because syphilis, if you remember, syphilis could go, um, it could produce, the bacteria that causes syphilis can produce a toxin that can shut down entire organ systems. So it could, if it goes too long, syphilis in the mother could kill her in addition to the fetus. All right, so these are all the things to avoid. Um, they say no caffeinated drinks. I didn't drink caffeine, except for a couple times I had caffeine when I was pregnant, but I really like cut out my coffee completely. Raw eggs, they gotta be cooked. Um, any kind of like lunch meats that are exposed to air unpasteurized anything. Any kind of drugs. Many drugs are lipid soluble. Remember, remember that our cell membrane has phospholipids, so they can, lipid soluble things can also diffuse through the placenta into that blood area. Thalidomide, so this is really, you know, like thalidomide, what people thought before having done a lot of research, this drug was really good for people who had morning sickness. And when I say in quotes morning, because like I had, I was sick from the minute I got up to the minute I fell asleep. Like I felt like I was gonna barf. Um, so I had to have, I did all kinds of things to try and keep my stomach from being upset. But so people like me might've been given thalidomide back in the 1950s and 60s. And what they found is that 
it had an effect on limb development, that the legs and arms were, they called them flippers, that they weren't fully developed, that kids would be born with like, almost like a flipper, instead of fully developed fingers and arms. Now they don't give that at all. Isotretonin, Accutane, this is one that you gotta go off of during, yeah. From like when you're trying, you gotta go off of it. Isotretonin can have an effect on lots of stuff. So it's like, you have to read a lot when you're planning <laughs> these days on pregnancies. If you're not planning, you gotta catch up really quick on like what not to do. Recreational drugs can diffuse as well. Even though like, for example, marijuana is legal now in our state, that's a no. Any of these can have an effect on development of pretty much any system. I'm not gonna go through every detail, but uh, they're bad. Cigarette smoke, all of these issues, all of these toxins. People who smoke have a higher rate of miscarriages, low birth weight. With recreational drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, they're even starting to point toward caffeine intake, behavioral, excuse me, behavioral and intellectual problems can develop. So just intelligence, but also things like ADD, ADHD, anxiety, depression. Back in the 1950s, this was pretty common that a woman would be smoking and have a martini. There's like ads, like she's pregnant. And you can end up with kids who are not happy. Uh, All right, so to get to your question, Liv, alcohol is like a double whammy because it can dissolve through lipids and water. Okay, so let's talk about alcohol content blood alcohol content. The blood, the amount of blood in a fetus is far less than of a mother. So let's say that you're a person who has one drink, whatever it is, you have one drink and you start to get buzzed. Just think about what that does to someone who is like a 20th, a 30th of your size. So their effects are going to be much higher. There's so much research that has recently come out that said, you know, if you ever heard people would say, oh, a glass of red wine is healthy for you. Now they're saying, no, nope. no alcohol ever is healthy for anybody. I know, so those of you who are Muslim, for example, right? Alcohol, you culturally and religious wise don't drink it. Much healthier, right? For those of you who don't drink alcohol at all, just because you don't like to. That's good. Fetuses can't metabolize the alcohol within their own body because a lot of metabolism does happen within their body. They're growing, right? It means that they have chemical reactions that are happening. The alcohol can interfere with those. Still about 12% of women are drinking a lot during pregnancy. 40,000 infants die from fetal alcohol syndrome. Kids with fetal alcohol syndrome are usually smaller in weight, anxiety, depression, aggressive, ADD, ADHD, focus problems too. If you have four to five drinks per day, five or more times, your fetus could have full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. So a few binge drinking episodes could lead to permanent damage of your fetus. When I was pregnant, 
12 years ago, research had come out to say no alcohol at all during pregnancy. That was like the start of, uh-uh, none. The US Surgeon General finally published data on that. Before that, there was this, I think, more social aspect that, that people, I'm not saying doctors would say this, but people would be like, it's okay to have like a glass of wine a week or a month. And now they say, no, not okay ever. And now they're again saying, alcohol is not good for anybody ever. So these, I don't see these ads enough to give that education. So drinking while pregnant, facial deformities like cleft lip and palate are common from people who have those little binge episodes delivered early. And then I talked about all of these things. So again, you know, as I mentioned before, embryo is like an early name. Fetus is like when it develops after about two months, we switch from the embryo term to the fetus term. I laugh because the textbooks will say, because it looks human at that point. I'm like, I don't know any humans who look like that. It's a little creepy looking. They say nine months of pregnancy, it's really like up to 10 months. So it can go right 40 weeks is about 10 months. At the end of development, the fetus just instinctually points its head down. So it starts to turn itself inside of the uterus, which is hard because there's not room in there, right? They're like, they're gonna be like, eh, 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 kind of starting to point their head downward. This is very important because if the vagina is down and if they go feet first out, they can put their arms out. And then if they put their arms out, their arms could get bent in the wrong direction and that could cause permanent damage, also could mean that delays them getting out and getting oxygen. So there's kind of like a critical point where they're like transitioning from breathing amniotic fluid and the amniotic fluid, when the water breaks, starts to go away. So then you have this window of like getting them out so that they can breathe oxygen from air. So during childbirth, you really want them head down because then they're like this, like they're going down a tube and their arms just naturally get put to the side. So it's gotta be done. As the fetus grows, remember that the uterus is growing. The estrogen is saying, grow, uterus, get bigger. To get the fetus out, there's a lot of feedback loops of hormones. Also, in addition, the vagina is like, that big, it's got to stretch to get a head about that big out. That's hard. So all of these things take a lot of energy and they're called labor. You're going to continue to have estrogen and now estrogen, progesterone, now prostaglandin. If you remember, prostaglandin is released in the semen. It helps the penis to contract upward. Prostaglandin is a type of chemical in bodies that cause for contraction. Prostaglandin is going to cause the contraction of the uterus to help assist pushing the fetus out. Uterus contract, hard, strong, labor, lots of hormone loops, lots of energy, hard, labor, right? When I think of hard work, it's labor. We often talk about when the biological mother is ready to give birth, they look at the dilation or expansion of the cervix by centimeters. Remember the cervix is the bottom of the uterus. That little hole has to start opening. And so it goes from being closed to one centimeter, two centimeters, to a point where it's you know, 10, 12 centimeters to accommodate the size of the fetus's head. If during this time there are any issues, the fetus isn't turned. Um, if somebody has, they call it breach, when the fetus is the wrong way, the head is up, what the doctor will do is the doctor will physically
try and manipulate the fetus to move downward in the mother's belly. Again, there's not a lot of room. And so that's like, that hurts. And the fetus doesn't do that. If naturally the fetus doesn't turn down or if the doctor can't get the fetus to turn, then they usually will schedule a cesarean or C-section. And they do a little cut in the abdomen cut open the bottom of the uterus, and then they surgically remove the fetus. When the cervix begins to stretch, signals are sent to the hypothalamus to release another hormone, which triggers oxytocin to be released from the pituitary gland. Oxytocin is gonna say, hey, everything contracts more. Oxytocin also is going to trigger milk production. So check this out. This is the bottom of the uterus, the cervix. Cervix is usually closed. It's going to begin to open one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four or five to get to enough centimeters, depending on the size of the fetus's head, usually about 10 to 12, and they're ready to be birthed. Look at the size of the vagina and the cervix. This has to come out of here. This is going to push on the bladder and the anus. Quite often during childbirth, the biological mother will poop because it's going to push this out. Pee. It's tough. A lot going on. So childbirth. This, all of these, like, all of the releases of these different hormones continue, continue, continue. Positive feedback loop. And one says, keep going, keep going, keep going. They all keep going until the fetus is up. But there's also not just the fetus has to come out, but the placenta has to come out. Is it possible for the placenta to object to the one to die? They have to get it out because the um, deterioration of it could cause infection. I just mean, like, does it ever happen that way? Yeah, they, they'll have to assist in birthing the placenta. They call it afterbirth. So they let that come and like, she doesn't even lose it. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes if they, even a piece of it gets left behind, someone can get an infection and get really sick. The, the skull, the bones of the skull are not fused together at birth which is a good thing because remember the size of the vagina is very small. And so that's gonna be very tight as childbirth happens. So their head can actually compress a bit. So some kids come out with like a comb head. Oh yeah. They or come out with like rings, bruising on their faces especially. Because once the head is out, they just slip out. So the rest of the body is pretty like, uh, they're not prone to getting the bruising or the like stress that the the head is. All right, when the baby's out, it's got to breathe on its own. It's got to start to regulate its metabolism. It has to get food. But we're lucky as humans because we have a whole team of people that are here to make sure that the baby does all these things. If you are a giraffe and you're out in an African savanna, your giraffes are tall. You drop onto the dirty earth. Mom, there's no doctors around or anybody around to help. So mom's got to go in there and with her mouth, cut the umbilical cord. She's got to bite it in half. Mom's got to watch out for predators. Giraffe has to walk. It's got to begin to walk right away because they might have to run from predators. We don't have to do all that, right? We take like uh, almost a year to walk. So a lot of other animals have developed behaviors and advancements upon birth that we do not have. The release of the placenta is called the, if you've heard of afterbirth, that's the placenta, is the afterbirth. Labor is not over until the placenta is birthed. So the fetus can be out, but mom is not done with the stress. Then it's gotta continue. After the placenta is out, 
All those hormones are low. Progesterone levels drop because the placenta is gone, the fetus is gone. And so the uterus can contract. Also then, when those levels all start to even out or completely bottom out, GnRH is going to kick in to begin the ovarian cycle. So it could take a couple weeks to a couple months before the ovarian and menstrual cycle are starting back up, but there are cases where they happen right away and within a couple months, the mother could get pregnant again. Prostaglandins are going to shut off the flow of blood in the umbilical cord. So if you've ever heard like, you've got to tie the umbilical cord, you don't have to do that. It will do that on its own. All mammals have this evolutionary property, but they don't bleed to death. So just a reminder of the way childbirth happens. You can see instinctually, well, there's not much room. So usually the fetus is kind of like that anyway, because there's not a ton of room. They don't have all this like swimming area. So they're ready, arms are at their side, sides of the vagina and the cervix are going to expand, expand, expand. The other thing to remember is that as the fetus grows, all of the organs in the lower body, mainly the digestive and urinary, get smushed. So that's why a woman later in her pregnancy has to pee a lot because the bladder is getting smushed by the fetus. We talk lastly about milk production. The pituitary gland are stimulated by the hypothalamus to release prolactin starting at the fifth week of pregnancy. So again, before a woman even might realize she's pregnant, this is going to make the breasts tender, start to hurt a little bit. So if they're just like not focused on their menstrual cycle and then they're suddenly like five weeks goes by and they haven't thought about it and this happens, they're like, oh, oh yeah, I haven't had my menstrual cycle in a while. As I mentioned, after birth happens, estrogen, progesterone levels go down, prolactin goes up, and we'll talk about oxytocin also goes up. Prolactin is for milk production. Prolactin, milk production. Prolactin is for milk production. It's for milk production. Oxytocin, oh, sorry, we haven't got there yet, but oxytocin is for milk ejection, which we'll get to. A feedback loop happens, positive feedback, as long as an infant is present to suckle the nipple of the mother, prolactin and oxytocin are produced. Let's say the mother dies in childbirth. So then you don't have this happening. Or let's say that the fetus is stillborn. Because there will be no suckling of the infant on the nipple, she will not produce milk. That will go down, or she'll have milk and then it'll go way down. Yeah. Why is it that um, some babies can't take like milk from like other women? So are like, why, why is it like sometimes like a baby will reject like the whole mother's milk? Just That's a good question, yeah. And it could be just something genetically the mother's having a hard time producing. And it's more about the mother maybe than the baby. Um, and then they might be able to supplement from someone else too. Yeah, there's milk banks too. So like, for example, like same sex couples, if they're two males who are adopting a baby, they could um, potentially get milk from a milk bank. So, and, and in that case too, a mother might choose to do that as well. Yeah. Also, the pituitary gland is gonna release oxytocin. So prolactin is for milk production. 
Oxytocin is for milk ejection. It causes muscular bands around the milk ducts to squeeze and push the milk out. Sorry, so still, this is a positive feedback loop. As long as the infant is suckling the nipple, then the milk production will continue to happen. Milk production, milk ejection will happen. So again, oxytocin is for milk ejection. And I'll show you a picture where there's bands around the milk ducts that are gonna squeeze, contract to push the milk out. So just again, remember the difference between prolactin, milk production, oxytocin, milk ejection. Here you can see, this is the one I'm talking about, is that your milk ducts, you've got muscular bands that oxytocin is going to stimulate these to contract. As long as an infant suckles the nipple, you are going to have the hypothalamus tell the pituitary gland to produce prolactin to produce milk and oxytocin to contract and help push the milk out to assist the infant with drinking the milk. So part of it is the sucking, another part of it is the ejecting. If a woman were unable to produce milk due to an endocrine gland disorder, she might consider prescribed injections of what to alleviate the problem? Prolactin. Yeah, so this is a good question to emphasize, prolactin. Right, always questions about Twins. When you're talking about identical twins, identical twins means that you have one egg in sperm, one egg gets fertilized by one sperm, begins the process of cleavage, and somewhere in the first couple weeks, the ball of cells splits into two. Which means they came from the same sperm and egg, but now they are going to become two individual people potentially. So that's why they're identical, because they came from the same genes, the same sperm and egg. A couple things can happen in terms of identical twins. Uh, one is identical twins will be the same sex, the same biological sex. The other thing is that the, the safety and development of them depends on where each ball of cells implants and where placenta or placentas are formed. So let's take, talk about the worst case scenario. Okay, so this ball of cells splits into two. Depending on when those two balls of cells, let's say that they don't split until the ball of cells is implanted already, and then it splits into two. If the ball of cells splits in the in one area, it may get one placenta, one amniotic sac formed. Okay, so unless they are perfectly in the middle of the placenta, they will both get about equal amounts of nutrients in, nutrients out. So this might be okay, but having one amniotic sac may not be great if, let's say, this one is in the middle and gets the majority of the placenta, and this one implants over here. What can happen, um, if you've ever heard that uh, somebody says, like, I absorbed my twin in birth, or I ate my twin in birth, it could be that they were identical twins, and they implanted in a good place on the placenta, and the twin implanted in a place that wasn't so good, and they just, like, died in there, basically got absorbed by the body. So I know identical twins, and one of them has, um, I don't know what he has, but something along the lines of Down's palsy or something like that, based off of what I've observed. So would that maybe be the case for why he got it? Is They're identical or fraternal? They're identical. Oh, interesting. So maybe he was the one that was like kind of off-centered? Well, that's a, um, uh, 
I don't know. Maybe as I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the genetics behind cerebral palsy. I don't know if it's that, but it's it's something where he doesn't have you know full control of most of his limbs. Okay. I'm I'm not sure. We'd need a lot more information to understand that, but potentially could have been that situation where they weren't given as much nutrient focus in the placenta. Okay. So here, there's one placenta. Not the most ideal thing. They could, so here they have two amniotic sacs, but they're still kind of connected with one placenta. So here it's kind of good, kind of bad. It's, it's again, depends. Like they implant on other sides, but there's still one placenta. So that's an iffy situation. So these aren't great. This is the best situation. They both implant on other sides of the uterus. They each get their own placenta. That's the safest way. Fraternal twins means that you have a brother or sister, just like if people have a brother or sister that's older or younger, kind of like you just have that, but in the same uterus at the same time. You come from different sperm and egg, just like an older brother might, you know, will come from. But you're just like at the same time. We're seeing a lot more of this happening with IVF intervention. Is that if like two or four embryos are implanted and two of them develop, then again, you'll have like the same situations. But ideally, they'll be implanted on opposite sides and all good. Uh, placenta previa, another question that students often have is that if the placenta, if the implantation of the embryo happens like here or here, you could get the placenta covering up the cervix. And then how do you get out? If you'd have to birth the placenta before you birth the child. So that gets a little iffy too. Um, that's a situation they keep an eye on. Would they do a cesarean here? Likely, yeah. And, but there's also like often complications where there'll be a bed rest for the person because they don't want the placenta to start to come out. And it can be a myriad of complications. So again, with the microbiome, um, when you have a vaginal delivery, the microbiome, you get a healthy microbiome from the vagina, which means like things like lactobacillus, which are important, gut microbes, a lot of E. coli, for example, helps normal development of the immune system. Also helps like this, what they call cytokines, which means like a, essentially a stacking of the immune system to happen in the right order and not overreact. When you have the production of specific cytokines during the vaginal birth, this will limit allergies, will limit overreactions of the immune system. So for example, like I was born via C-section, my son was born via C-section, we both get really high fevers in response to getting sick. So like I was sick this week, on Sunday night I had 104 fevers. And I wasn't that sick. I had a really bad sore throat. And I just was like, I don't want to give it to anybody else. I felt run down, but that 104 fever kicks my butt. But almost every time I'm a little bit sick, whoop, my fever goes up because I did not develop this normal cytokine response. So increase with that, when you have a C-section, increases like asthma, allergies, celiac disease, immune, um, uh, immune system disorders, so any of the ones that we talked about, could also delay lactation in the mother. So oftentimes, like I have a friend right now, she had a C-section, she was having a hard time with, like you said, like the, the fetus, her and the fetus just kind of like meshing. And I said, just keep working at it for another week. It'll come because she had, I told her about this. I was like, I'm lecturing about you essentially this week. So that could be a little bit harder. It takes maybe a little bit more work. I mentioned also with C-section, it's good to ask for that vaginal swab because you don't get 
these and you're more susceptible to getting other kinds of like, of, sorry, excuse me. But you're also, because you're doing like more skin to skin, you can get other microbes. So it's, you know, a little bit of this and that, uh, but always better to do vaginally.